John Schmaker will introduce our speaker this morning. Morning, everybody. Um, I did keep it to one page. No. <clears throat> Excuse me. The uh, first time I ever met an admiral, I was a sailor on USS Ariskany, an aircraft carrier. She was the flagship for a carrier division operating in the Gulf of Tonkin. Our flag officer, who was rarely on board, was Admiral John S. McCain, Jr., whose son, the future senator, lay captive in the Hanoi Hilton at the time. My watch station meant that I spent several hours every day on the bridge manning the ship's helm. Yes, with my 2800 plus vision, I was steering the damn ship. <laughs> Once in the middle of the night and in heavy seas, after climbing ladders and stepping through hatches on my way to the bridge, the ship pitched in the water. I lost my balance and bumped hard into a chief petty officer approaching me from the other direction, almost knocking him off his feet. At least I thought it was a chief. <laughs> Under the red lights, I didn't see the stars on his collar until I got way too close. <laughs> I apologized and the Admiral was friendly about it. This man with incredible power and responsibility was human enough to joke about it. E3 meets O10. We both moved on. <laughs> The next admiral I met <clears throat> was Michael Franken. He has also held incredible power and responsibilities over his nearly 40 year years of defending our democracy. But you will find he will likely relate to you as the friendly Iowa farm boy that he is. <laughs> Mike Franken grew up in Lebanon, not the country, but a little town in now deep red Northwest Iowa. His Navy career took him to far flung places around the world, but his story is pure Iowan. The son of a school teacher and a dad who owned a machine shop, he was the youngest of nine children. That alone marks him as a courageous fighter to me as I barely survived growing up with just two sisters. <laughs> as a young man, Mike worked in his father's machine shop. He also worked as a hired farmhand, and by age 20 had completed a three-year stint working at a slaughterhouse in Sioux Center. He then earned his engineering degree from the University of Nebraska and a master's in physics from the Naval Postgraduate School. So you may note that he is a scientist. Michael Franken dedicated his life to serving our country. He has served on ships at sea and in the Pentagon. He was the only voice on a team of military advisors to oppose George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq. He served under President Barack Obama and oversaw numerous successful missions to protect our country including leading U.S. forces in Africa to fight terrorists and pirates. The man has been there. He's done more than you can imagine. Check out his Wikipedia entry sometime. <laughs> Flag-ranked military officers are a rare breed. I don't know where David Cotton is this morning, but <laughs> um, they understand leadership, courage, and loyalty to our constitution. We are lucky to have this officer and gentleman running for the Senate to replace the calcifying Chuck Grassley. <laughs> when Michael Franken joins the Senate, he will be the most senior military person to ever serve in that august body. And we will have a sen Senator we can trust 
to always put country over party and people over politics. And by the way, <clears throat> next Tuesday is election day, but it's also Mike's birthday. Michael Franken gives us hope for the future of this country. And I promised him I'd give him a few minutes to say a few words of his own. <laughs> so please welcome Michael Franken. Right. It's actually ossifying versus calcifying, I think. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here. You may wonder, well, what's this guy going to talk about? I never quite know until I stand up here, which gives CJ the willies, just so you know. Never quite knowing what, what the old guy's going to say. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and um, I'm very pleased to be at this stage of, of uh, this campaign. Uh, things are going swimmingly. Um, I wear this hat principally because it covers up the horns, which which I'm known for in some of the ads. And that's why I called myself the A-word this morning, because every day there's uh, there's another hit ad on me. You should know that I'm uh, much of that is uh, demonstrably false. I'm just a regular fellow like uh, like like many of you and uh, and had had an opportunity in life to um, you know, uh, venture off and uh, took a scholarship test and didn't know I was going to stay in the military for so long. But you should know in the military, um, I was that we make up everyone, everybody from all walks of life, as John was. And I know exactly what he's talking about that seaman who drives the ship. And uh, who the, the conning officer, the person who drive, who really gives the orders, et cetera, and the captain sitting up there, you become this close uh, networked group. And, and I've got fabulous moments of being a lot of bridge time, sailing the uh, all through the world and having been involved in uh, of the 13 named operations in this country since, uh, since the 80s, I've been involved in all but three, uh, intimately so. And um, and I got to know people like John from uh, and Jane and from all walks of life, and uh, we set about uh, I think impacting each other in ways that go through and pervade each other's lives for perpetuity. So here we're at this crossroads, I think, in Iowa, and this effort that we're working to achieve is truly for. I think the slope, the trend, the soul, the life of the state of Iowa, because it's things are not going the way I had anticipated when I was an 18 year old in Lebanon, Iowa, all 50 people, a fifth of whom were in my family. Um, and just so you know, I had six sisters stacked on top of me at 18 month intervals. So I was a survivor early on indeed. Um, but it, but Iowa at the time, where we were first in the nation in ed education, uh, we had some of the most inventive and leaning forward environmental considerations from farming perspective. Uh, we hadn't been introduced to the large monopolistic, uh, vertically integrated ag situation that we have today. Uh, we were people who got along and didn't talk about politics so much. And outside of church in the morning, the men would smoke the cigarettes and the, the women would um, would retire mostly in the basement and chat about matters of affairs and estates and the like. And we all got along. It was it was uncanny. Today in rural Iowa, you don't see much of that. The division, the act, the acrimony, the animus is palpable and, and making the church pew the dinner parties, the coffee clutch, the bowling leagues, all the pickleball leagues being uncomfortable. We need to cure that of ourselves. And I must say that uh, politicians are to be blamed for much of this, along with uh, the media organizations, which are more about sensationalizing than they are reporting. Um, the I think the United States has made some mistakes internationally, which has given us a pallor of, I think, um, 
I, th I think a criticism in central internal criticism to ourselves where we're not that that uh, broad-minded altruistic uh, attempting to help country that we need to return to and a lot of that is the frailties associated with man and how we view things and in our inner id has a tendency to overpower our sensibilities from up here. Mm -hmm. uh, I faced a lot of that in the military. So yes, lived on four continents, moved almost 30 times uh, in life. So and I believe that's a good perspective. I don't think you ought to be a politician who from a single zip code, mine 51250, I think having the broad perspective of the world, having lived in not one, but two Muslim countries in two different, two different continents, uh, living across from the Grand Mosque and having everybody as your friend uh, in your neighborhood gives you a good perspective on the equality of humankind. Uh, and also the likes and the desirabilities and the aspirations, which are shared amongst all of us in a high percentage uh, of, you know, in the, in the center plane similarities. But we have a tendency to divide, our, divide ourselves over the nationalism, racism, um, sexuality, income levels, uh, geography, which is absolutely uh, undermining the strength of this country. My job is to heal. My, my job is to have art on fire every day and have a jaw of steel. My job is to be that unfailing voice for the state of Iowa and for this country. So um, having uh, served early on the Hill, I, yeah, I went, I was a science person, ended up at MIT and at the business school at, at Virginia and a few other good schools. But I ended up also uh, as, this, as this Iowa farmer in King Arthur's court early on working for Ted Kennedy. It's the first military person to do so. And he introduced me to just get it done, incrementally so, using working across the aisle. So from Orrin Hatch to um, Strom Thurmond, I'm, I'm making that up. He didn't do anything. To, to uh, John McCain and, and uh, John Warner and a host, of, a host of others in the 90s. We got things done and we got along. It was amazing. And I, and I couldn't, the staffers that I worked on, I couldn't tell you if they were Democrat or Republican, frankly. Um, and today, none of that happens. It's sitting on your perspective side of the table, and you fight through things, and you move on. And I was Obama's chief of legislative affairs, and I worked in the front office in the Bush administration at the cabinet level, seeing how decisions are made and this, the associated frailties involved in those decisions. And I saw the spiraling downward of the sensibilities of America. And my job is to push back on that. I think I would be best served if I answered some questions of you all. But a couple of uh, little issues with the with the campaign. Um, we have outraised uh, Chuck Grassley using individual campaign donations from across the United States and across the globe of uh, citizens living elsewhere. Um, this is remarkable. We don't take corporate PAC money. The dark money. We don't have any of that. Uh, this is unique. I get told. I get. I get told by my Democratic colleagues, "Oh, Frank, and you got to take corporate money." No, actually, you don't. You just don't need to do that. You can be a person of the people, and and people want to see your representation. Ultimately, we need to get the money out of politics. It is. It is. It is absolutely inimical to what's needed um, because it corrupts. The old saying, mom's old saying is, is right. It corrupts absolutely. And, uh, and, and the fact that, you know, the various industry and associated um, advocacy groups give campaigns millions of dollars, they're buying votes. Having worked on the Hill for seven, eight years, they are buying votes. There's no, there's no altruism involved in any of this. It's a transaction. Uh, and it and it denudes from what should be a meritocracy. Uh, and I would like to work very hard to ensure the campaign finance reform is implemented. Uh, and there's a host of other issues. Uh, we are we've got a great ground ground game. 
I think also the bottom line is there's a sea change needed in the state of Iowa and people realize this. My farmer friends in Northwest Iowa that I played high school sports with, uh, droned on in classes where they tried to all date my sisters, et cetera. They know it as well. They can't keep going on this way. They go to church every day and then they listen to uh, the previous president in, in Sioux City yesterday harp about the oddities of life. You can't be this way. We can't elect, we cannot elect people. We cannot have Congresswomen who say that Ukraine to hell with them. I mean, the short sighted idiot perspective, idiot perspective, and I'm not overstating that is not America. And if you want to be a broad shouldered, big chested strength and the international currency and the democracy of the great experiment, you have to, you have to, you have to stand up for what's right in the world. You can't pick and choose your fights. And uh, fighting is, is a more broad perspective. It doesn't have to be with bullets. It can be with ideas. And America needs to stand up. So let me answer some questions from you all and let you know that on Tuesday, I think we're going to win this. So thank you. After all you've achieved, you've never forgotten the people who helped you get there and contributed to your success. So go ahead and say thank you. Thank you. Sir. Yes, sir. Sure, you bet. So the question was um, uh, the comment, uh, thanking for service, and I appreciate that. Uh, um, you need not say that, frankly. Um, when what to what to do in the next couple of days to push us over the top? Mostly, it's get out the vote. <laughs> Mostly, it's to get out the vote. Uh, and, and to ensure that we have a viable means of staying on the radio and TV, that's the defeatchuck.com website and all that. But, but the big issue is we all have friends and family stretched across the hinterlands. So if you can just send them a little social media missive of sorts, a text or something and say, Hey, take a look, know who you're voting for, know what's at stake, know what the future vision is. No truth from heresy, and uh, just win on the win on the concept of ideas matter. Uh, and 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 you know altruism and empathy, the two the two skills which I think every politician ought to be overly invested in. We see too little of that. Um, you know, I, I've I've known Lindsey Graham for ages. He's not the Lindsey Graham I remember. Um, I, you know, I, I've, I don't, I don't know what's what's happened to people. I just don't get it. Uh, and I know they're in their souls. They've got some. They got they got a lot of goodness, uh, but they've been contorted. I didn't say perverted. I be, I said contorted. Um, so just help out in that regard. And I and I and you do need to vote, please. And if you can. Bring some friends along with you in that voting booth, irrespective of who they vote for. Make sure they just know what the issues are, and they're voting for the next generation. Vote as if you're planting a tree under whose shade you'll never walk. And, um, I grew up in Northwest Iowa, which is well. Uh, Where? are helping them out. Republicans are people who have their back. 
And they say there's words to the land, but speaking as a farmer and a scientist, what is your feeling about the crisis of, of our climate? Uh, so um, this has to do with in Pomeroy, Iowa, and the perspective of climate and the farmer's perspective that Republicans do them better justice. Uh, that's a the most, I think the most effective psychological warfare ever conducted on a population has been conducted on the United States, unbeknownst to most of the population. And it began, um, just going back a little bit of history, in 1995, I was the number two person at the Chief of Legislative Affairs of the Department of the Navy. And one of my one of my guys, I didn't know he worked for me, but he was uh, caught in Georgia handing out paraphernalia at a at a Newt Gingrich rally for the uh, the leadership in the Republican Party. And of course, it was a hatch, it was a hatch violation for this young man, which didn't go well for his career, which was unfortunate because he was a nuclear engineer and of, of high of high import, and we had to drum him out of the service for that. He just didn't know. Uh, Newt took advantage of him. <clears throat> but the but the paraphernalia they were handing out was in essence that the demographics are working against the Republican Party, uh, lie, cheat, steal, ob, uh, obfuscate, and obstruct are the methodologies going forward. This is a no holds barred effort. And it didn't, it didn't, and, and Fox News and others were part of this and they were heavily funded. And and I don't mean I don't mean to point point fingers, but I mean it was very clear. Uh and it didn't. It didn't have a. It didn't have a big following initially, but it gained strength over time. Certainly during the Bush administration, and uh, it 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 was. It came to full fruition during the Trump Obama administration, and we're seeing the end states today, where a cultish type of personality, who's certainly guilty of all seven deadly sins multiple times in one's life, is not the father figure. Is not the man in a non-gender specific way we would want to be as a dinner guest. And yet we uh, we court him with a feverish devotion uh, and then believe the oddities associated with him. A lot of the, regarding the climate issue we have is uh, this American love affair with the, uh, money and uber capitalism that has a tendency to be blinded by the, by the realities of today and to fall victim to the, I, I'm not exactly sure. Um, farming, and just go back to the comparison, Democratic and Republican. If you look at the income of my opponent, the years as a farmer during the Republican administrations, his income came from subsidies. And I'm not, I'm not denigrating this. This is just true. These are just the numbers. Uh, his primary source during Republican or Democrat administrations was through farming. And we're seeing that today. Speaking to the Fort Dodge radio station the other day, he said, hey, what are you, the, the farmers are really concerned about Biden and ethanol and putting them out of business. And I said, Michael is his guy's name. Michael, do you remember the ethanol plants that went out of business and went cold iron during the Trump administration? Do you remember that? Uh, we're at six dollars and eighty cent corn right now. Um, this has been the history of farming in Iowa going back to the eighties. Do you remember Reagan, the high interest rates followed by the farm debacle, farm fo followed by the savings and loan debacle, interspersed with three combat operations, none of which we needed to do. None of which we needed to do. I got involved in all three of them. Do you remember that? How blind can we be for crying out loud? Do you know how good it was during the Clinton years? So part of that Newt Gingrich plan stems from the pulpit and the constant haranguing from Fox, slightly off-key messaging. Fascinating how it's done. To the point when I was a senior military officer on the African continent, and I'm sitting at a long table with various uh, ministers, foreign affairs specialists, national security specialists, and a couple of chiefs of, uh, chiefs of state uh, presidents. 
And uh, they like to come to breakfast, mostly Muslim countries and, and some evangelical Christian countries, et cetera, like Addis Ababa or like Ethiopia. And because they could eat, and I'd take the, I'd take the name tags off the food so they didn't know what was pork. And, and they liked that. And uh, so breakfast was a big thing for us to have meetings. And, I, and the TVs were on muted, but they were in the background and they can all speak English. And it was haranguing about S whole countries, blah, 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 blah. So I pulled the plug on Fox, pulled the plug. And for and I had, this facility had 4,000 people on board and including 1,000 third nation nationals. And many people are armed. This is in a combat zone. And I found their messaging to be inimical to the, my mission and justified it as such. And no one said anything about it and replaced them with Petticoat Junction and gun smoke and stuff like that. And everybody was better for it. Um, you know, sensibility, if I had to ask everybody to go forward with, I'd say, be kind, uh, do it with a smile, be, have, the, have a few facts with you. I keep a little sheet around saying, well, well, people would ask me in Northwest Iowa, what's the difference between a Republican and Democrat? Okay. So, uh, a quick story. I'm full of stories. I walk into a bar on a Thursday night. This is not a joke. I walk into a bar in Sioux Center, Iowa, my hometown with my high school buddy who's a farmer and uh, who started from scratch and has done, doing, done, done a good job in life and uh, never went to college or anything like that. Still did, did fabulous. And the bartender knows me. No one else does. It's mostly college, but this many college kids from Northwestern and, uh, and Dort, the two schools. And because uh, it was a college thing, that night. and the bartender says, hey, everybody, an admiral from here, Sioux Center, and he's a Democrat, walked in the room and all the heads turned on a swivel. And someone yelled, why are you a Democrat in a condescending way? And I said, well, and I had everybody's attention. Um, shall we name some of the accomplishments of the Democratic Party? that affect you, 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 your parents, and your grandparents. Let's start with women's suffrage and go to rural electrification, the GI Bill, the New Deal, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Name one thing, and I, and I, I went through a list of 20. It became monotonous. Name one thing the, Republic, the Republicans have done that have changed your life. And it's a, it's a Jeopardy moment, a beer to anybody who answers this. And they, they all cuddled and they collected a couple of shout outs. No, it's not true. No, nope, that didn't happen. Nope, nope, that was in 1820. Uh, and finally, it was clean air, clean water, Nixon administration, 1972 at threat of veto. And, and a, a woman, a younger woman leaned back on the bar and said, well, that's good, right? Yes, vetoed 2018 by the Trump administration. Oh, that was Feenstra's daughter. Just so you know. Yeah. And uh, I said, listen, everyone, you grew up in a religion, you grew up in a family environment, you grew up in a sensibility as a family and a dogma of, you, of wherever you were in life. And now you're at the stage where you're learning for yourself. And you need to be broad minded about what's best, not go overboard but not go, not shoot under, under either. And it's incumbent upon all of you to make this decision. And you know what? They all stood up and shook my hand as I walked out. Not all, but a lot. So I think that's kind of what we need to do. And for farming, we have the opportunity in Iowa to have the cheapest electrical grid, the most sustainable, rejuvenating, regenerative farming, and energy to change the job structure and the wage scale and the quality of life. And the overarching considerations of my future in this state is to ensure the 18 year olds at least consider, Hey mom, I'm thinking of staying. Hey dad, I'm thinking of staying. And the 28 year olds to, to call and say, Hey, you know what? I think I'm going to go back to Pomeroy and raise a family and start this little business because I can do it because, you know, in a carbon tax environment, I can make money with my high-speed computing in my basement right here. 
Um, and also for the 65 year olds to say, you know what, this is my formative years. We're here. The healthcare is good. My friends are here. I'm going to come back to Iowa. I want to retire here. And global, global warming is such that we have a, an October that like we did, uh, at least give that consideration and let's change the ship of state. Last question, please. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in uh, as a manager of a large organization, and the largest I had was just around right on 7,000 people. Um, and you got to get the big concept right, the big idea. And it, you, you needn't have unanimity with those around you, but you've got to have more right than wrong in that unanimity that, that perspective. And once you're, once you're on board with it, you, you gather your advisors and you should not, not, not have like-minded individuals, not, not, not strive for those from different walks of life, different experiences, different color, different, different languages, different belief systems, but the big strategy has got to be right. Uh, and then at the molecular level, the who, what, when, where, why, how speaking, how speaking, these words dressed as this and this location that needs to get right and everything else in between is staff time and and the and where you rely on good staff to do the work uh, the united states has a strategic perspective in the world and that is we should work towards peace in humankind uh, we should also work to the ideals and what's happening here, the Vladimir the Impaler has every intention of reigniting white Russia. You notice he didn't go after Kazakhstan or Tajikistan or Turkmenistan uh, or the far west, or the far east. He doesn't care. The Muslims, people of Hazara life, blood, the Kazakhs, not, doesn't care. What he wants is white Russians. And after Ukraine, it is Romania, it is Serbia, it is uh, uh, Bulgaria, and then it's the fringes of Poland and Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. Make no mistake about it. He has every intention of doing that. Keep in mind that when Ukraine announced their independence from the CIS, the first country which recognized them was Russia. And remember, Russia's signatories to the Shanghai Cooperative and the overarching number one issue of a Shanghai Cooperative is thou shalt not invade thy neighbor. None of that, none of that crap matters. He has a, he has, he sees himself as a savior and Ukraine is just one issue. Now he invaded with the expectation that within a few days, they'd be waving flags of triumphant arrival. Uh, obviously he miscalculated. Don't, uh, don't underestimate him because of that, because you know what? The United States has done the same thing in our past. Um, and we didn't quite weigh what we were doing correctly. And uh, the Ukrainians have done a nice job. And nowhere in history does the denigration of civilian in infrastructure mean you're going to win. All you do is toughen them. And a wrecked building, a collapsed building, all that is, is a dangerous place to, to ride by because everybody's hiding in it and they're going to shoot you. Um, and, you know, read the history of Chechnya to know the intricacies of that. Um, so we need to provide the, the Ukrainians the necessary um, tools to roll back the Russians. And we need to in, ensure the Russian soldiers, unfortunate, unfortunate conscripts they are, that the end state, and I'm sure they're talking about this now, is you either surrender, you retreat, um, you go AWOL, or you fertilize the soil. So take your pick. And it's a, there's a cruel side of war, but it's a reality. And it's the only thing that Vladimir is going to understand. And he's not going to die of cancer. He's not going to get uh, overthrown. He's going to have to swallow a hard pill 
impressed upon him by his oligarchs and his, and his inner circle. And that's going to be really hard for him to do, but uh, it will be helpful as winter sets in and Russia's got their own problems. And we should watch how this, how this moves in the meantime, uh, the winter wheat uh, uh, deal that was recently struck is favorable, but that country feeds 500 million people. And north of the Sahal in Africa, think Egypt in particular, uh, lesser extent Tunisia and uh, Morocco, some of the outlying areas, they're going to be in need of small grain feed stocks. And uh, this will run up prices. And you're going to see violence this wintertime in some of those countries because the price is going to go up. Uh, the United States is not in a position to uh, compensate that. But next year, if this conflict is continuing, and it will, we need to change the manner in which we do our agriculture to help out the world community. And there'll be profit in it. Uh, some of the small grain stocks here in the state of Iowa, we can do two plantings. But we need to get on that now. You're not going to hear this from either one of my Senate uh, the, uh, serving senators in the state of Iowa. They just don't think that way. And, and they don't have that broad perspective. But, you know, my, my sense is that we're overdue to have that. Thank you, everyone.